Karen already got the juices flowing in our brains today about fear, but I wonder, what is your greatest fear? Now, you might say public speaking, or heights, or spiders. You might say passing an exam, or graduating. Maybe you just made a big decision, and your fear is that you might regret that decision. Maybe it's fear of an illness, how it's changing you or your loved one or your family. It could be the fear of grief, the power and grip that it has on your life. Maybe you fear whether you'll be able to have the family you desire or the job you seek or a healthy relationship. Maybe you fear your finances or the stock market. We all live with some level of fear, some of us more than others. And we're told in today's text that even the shepherds have fear. They're terrified, in fact. But before I get to the shepherds, I want to talk about tigers and sailors first. Bear with me, I will get back to the shepherds. So first, tigers. So for many years, I learned, these big, beautiful creatures have puzzled researchers because it seems that when tigers hunt, they have a remarkable capacity for causing their prey to be paralyzed with fear, a capacity greater than even other big cats. As the tiger charges toward its prey, it lets out sort of a spine-chilling roar And you would think that this roar would be enough to make the prey turn around and run away, to get out of there. But instead, the prey often freezes and becomes, well, tiger food. Now, at the turn of this century, scientists discovered why you are likely to freeze rather than run when a tiger charges at you. And it's for three reasons. First, because there's a flash of color coming at you. It's also because the tiger roars and lets out that audible sound that's so loud and terrifying. And it's also because when it roars, it lets out a sound at a frequency that's so low, you can't hear it, but you can feel it in your bones. And so the combination of those three things, the sight, the sound, the feeling, is sort of an all-out assault on the senses of the prey, and so they're paralyzed in their tracks. And even though there might have been time to run away from the tiger, you're tricked into standing there long enough for them to get you. Now, my title is, Yes, Fear is Often Our First Reaction, and It Doesn't Have to Be Our Last. In this case, unfortunately, it is the last emotion for these prey. But we're not animals, are we? We're humans. And so we should be able to rise above being paralyzed by our fear, shouldn't we? Now, our fears may not paralyze us physically. However, they often paralyze our reasoning and our rationale, right? They propel us into imagining and creating all kinds of terrifying scenarios for our future, right? How many of you have ever done this? The spiral of thinking, of worry. Am I the only one? Okay, thank you, a few out there. Well, one day in 1819, 3,000 miles off the coast of Chile, in one of the most remote regions of the Pacific Ocean, 20 American sailors watched their ship flood with seawater. The ship had been struck by a whale, and as the ship began to sink, they huddled together in three life rafts or boats, and these guys were 10,000 miles away from home, more than 1,000 miles away from the nearest scrap of land. And in their boats, they had a few rudimentary navigational tools, a little bit of food and water, but not a lot. Now, these were the men of the whale ship called Essex, whose story inspired parts of Moby Dick. Even in today's world, their situation would be really dire. Think about, though, how much worse it would have been back then. 
Nobody on land had any idea that something had gone awry. No search party was coming for them. So as they're floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they know that they need to make a plan. However, their imaginations and their fears start to get the best of them. They come up with three options. Now, the nearest islands that they could reach were the Marquesas Islands, 1,200 miles away. However, somebody had heard a rumor about these islands. They'd been told that the islands were populated by cannibals. So they pictured themselves coming ashore only to be, quote, eaten for dinner. Now, another possibility was them going to Hawaii, but given the season, the captain was afraid that they'd be struck by horrible storms. And the last option was the longest and the most difficult, to sail 1,500 miles due south in hopes of reaching a certain band of winds that would eventually push them toward the coast of South America. The sheer length of that journey would stretch their supplies of food and water. So the options in their mind, be eaten by cannibals, be battered by storms and drowned to death, or starve before reaching land. These were the fears in their imaginations. They deliberated and finally made a decision, and their decision was driven by the terrible fear, the rumor, that the closest islands had cannibals on them. So they chose to go the longer, more difficult route to South America. And of course, after a few months out on sea, they were out of food, out of water. And when the last of the survivors were finally picked up by two passing ships, less than half of the men were alive, and some of them had resorted to the very thing they were afraid of the most, cannibalism. This is a pretty dire story. I tell it, though, because it raises this question of why the men dreaded the rumored possibility of cannibals on an island that they could feasibly reach more than they dreaded the likelihood of starvation trying to get to islands that they knew they would never reach. You've probably heard this before, but some say that fear stands for false evidence appearing true. False evidence appearing true or real. And it's so real, in fact, that we start to believe in our heads the worst version of what could happen. And in fact, we can become prone to think that the worst version is what will happen. It begins to determine how we'll act. So you see, the men of the Essex ship leaned more into their imaginations and their fears instead of into their rationale. They had this vivid image of what would happen to them on one island and a much less vivid image of starvation. It was just something that would happen gradually. Perhaps, had they been able to tap into their more scientific, rational mind, they would have listened to that voice of reason, but they couldn't get there because they were afraid. Now, we all do this, don't we, to some extent. Some of us, say, worry more about plane crashes than we do the, the gradual plaque buildup in our arteries even though the likelihood is that the plaque in our arteries is going to affect us more than an unlikely pl plane crash. Now, what does all of this have to do with Luke 2? Well, on the most basic level, the tiger's prey and the sailor's story remind us that fear is not only a part of our lives, it holds very real consequences for our lives, especially when we allow it to grip us. And maybe our fears don't physically kill us, but they can stunt our spiritual growth. They can cut us off from others emotionally. They can keep us from thriving and fulfilling our potential. They can keep us even from enjoying today, this moment, because we're so worried about the future. Fear is so prevalent even in the story of the birth of our Savior. Even Jesus doesn't escape fear. In fact, his whole birth story is laced with the angelic pronouncement, do not be afraid, fear not. The angels say this to Mary, to Joseph, to the shepherds. They always seem to have to cushion their entrance with fear not. 
I mean, something must have been off-putting about their presence. Something must have been unsettling. I feel sorry for Jesus growing up as a little boy, asking about his birth story, everyone having to tell him how afraid they were of him coming. Well, we know that the shepherds felt fear because the text tells us they were terrified. Now, shepherds are used to fighting off all kinds of prey at night, right? They, they had to protect their sheep, after all. So the fear they felt, I'm guessing, was probably not the panic kind of fear you have. I mean, they had probably seen a lot of things. They were used to being brave on behalf of their sheep. I wonder if their fear was more about how this news would change their life, more than it was about any physical threat to their life. Like, what would it mean for them to go from being excluded to included? You see, shepherds were not used to receiving angelic messages that were divinely inspired. They were shunned to the sides of society, never included in its most important messages. They were excluded from the temple because of purity laws, and you know, they were told you can't be in the presence of God. And so I wonder, was their fear more about how this would change their life instead of about any physical threat to their life? There's an Indian philosopher named Judu Krishnamurti who says, one is never afraid of the unknown. One is afraid of the known coming to an end. We're not afraid of the unknown, we're afraid of the known coming to an end. What would happen to the shepherds? What would happen to the life they were leading if they listened to the angel? Maybe that was their fear. Well, we know how they responded, right? They went to Bethlehem. They didn't let fear drive their decision. They answered this call with curiosity and companionship. Now, much like when Mary received a visit from Gabriel and when Joseph had a dream, I I really doubt that the shepherd's fear just dissipated the minute that the angels reassured them. I think their fear is in part what drove them to Bethlehem. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what message was going to come to them or what it meant, but they were willing to take a risk, a chance. Even in their fear, they're curious. They say, let's go see. They let their curiosity draw them instead of their fear hinder them. And they say, let's, let us go see. In other words, they go together. They don't just send one shepherd ahead as a scout, which is probably what I would have recommended if we were gathering in a council to debate this. They all go together. Now, there are things that can temper our fears, and I think these are two of them, curiosity and companionship. They don't make our fears go away, but they can help us step out in faith and imagine with hope a new possibility for our lives. Instead of becoming paralyzed in fear, instead of falling prey to the worst thing we can imagine, isn't it true that we often need others to pull us up out of our fear? to point our eyes to a different reality? You know, in our culture, as we grow up, we're told to think of fear as a weakness. We say, don't worry, don't panic. Fear is something that we conquer, it's something that we fight, it's something that we overcome. There's an author named Karen Thomas Walker who encourages us us to look at fear in a fresh way. She says, what if instead of calling fears, fears, we called them stories? Because that's really what fear is, if you think about it. It's a kind of unintentional storytelling that we're all born knowing how to do. Think about kids and monsters under their bed, she says. We have this imaginatory capacity from a very young age to bring our fears to life. She says, fears and storytelling have the same components. They have the same architecture. Like all stories, fears have characters. And in our fears, guess what? We are the characters. Fears also have plots. They have beginnings and middles and ends. I mean, you board the plane, the plane takes off, the engine crashes, and so forth. 
Fears tend to contain imagery that is every bit as vivid as stories, she says, and they often have suspense, and they drive us toward this question, what is going to happen next? What is going to happen to me in the future? Now, here's where she's going with all of this. She says, if we think of our fears as stories, then not only are we the authors of those stories, we can be the readers of those stories as well, which means we can choose how to read our fears, how to make meaning from them, and that can have a profound effect on our lives. We can learn lessons from our fears far before they ever become a reality. And when we make meaning from them, guess what? We become less afraid. Because if we think them through, then they become known to us. They're no longer unknown. So whether we like what the fear is telling us or not, its familiarity helps us move forward in faith. The shepherds are asked to jump into a story that they thought had nothing to do with them. Since when did their lives relate to anything that God was doing in the world? They weren't even allowed into the temple. When the angels left them, they could have said, did you just see what I saw? Okay, good, it was probably just a dream, maybe we were hallucinating. They could have just written it off and gone about their business and trusted what they knew and what they already thought to be true. But they go to Bethlehem They don't believe the myth that nothing special happens to them and that they're not crucial to God's story. They take a risk, they follow God's voice, they go. They don't let their fears get the best of them. Fear is such a natural emotion in us that we're all going to experience it. The question is, do we let that fear paralyze us? Do we let it close off our curiosity? Do we let it close us off to other people? Or do we allow our fear to move us forward in faith? A deeper faith. A faith that calls us to actually walk the journey that so many people have walked before us. A journey of walking in fear, right? Not avoiding it. A journey of walking in fear with others toward Emmanuel, God with us. See, Scripture tells us that after seeing the baby Jesus, that the message to the shepherds, well, they discover it's true. And so all of a sudden, joy overcomes them, and they return, and they're glorifying and praising God. They hold their fear and their joy together. This is why I love the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, for that one line, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee, in God, tonight. You can say hopes and fears, you can say joys and griefs, laughs and tears, wonders and worries, put whatever words in there you want. The truth of that message is that whatever mix of emotions we're feeling, they are all held within the Christ child, within God's self. So, what does this mean? It means you're not weird, for not feeling only joy during Christmas. It means that nothing is wrong with you if you're not able to shake grief. It means that you might get angry every now and again, and that's okay. You're human. In fact, this idea of the hopes and fears of all the years being joined in God, well, that maybe even just might make you a bit more divine when you allow yourself to experience more than one emotion at once. When you don't let yourself fall into that narrative of saying, I am grieving, I am angry, I am afraid. Maybe you are afraid, and you're open to learning something new. Maybe you are grieving, and you have many things in your life that you're still grateful for, even in your grief. Maybe you're angry, and yet you're still be able to express kindness, both and, yes and. This whole Advent idea of being open and making space is all about not having to eliminate one thing to experience another. Perhaps more realistic than eliminating our fears or our concerns about the future 
is the possibility of just making space within our fear, within our worries, for moments of joy to break in. Isn't that what the incarnation is all about? In our fears, in our worries, in the devastation of this world, in the darkness, light breaks in, joy breaks in, peace breaks in, to remind us that both are possible, that what we see before us is not our only truth. I give you this example because it's been true for my life. I wonder when something happens to us that we're afraid of, you know, sometimes we might say, because this is happening to me, I am afraid. And therefore, my, my future is wrecked, or my life is over, or nothing is ever going to change, right? I mean, you know that downward spiral. It doesn't lead anywhere helpful. Perhaps the story is, because this is happening to me, yeah, I'm afraid. And also, my life is more than just this one experience, this one relationship, this one job, this one circumstance or challenge. In fact, my future is full of possibilities, some potentially impacted by this fear, yes, but others not. I may be afraid, and yet my fear won't control me. In the midst of my fear, like the shepherds, I can journey. I can be curious about what's next. I can talk to others about what's happening to me so I have companions in the journey. I can do things that are totally unrelated to my fear. I can experience joy and I can shout it from the rooftops. I can meet God, in fact, in my fear. Don't just take it from the shepherds. Many times in the Bible, God followers are exhorted to fear not, to be not afraid. Think about it. That fear is never the entirety of their story, is it? It's never the end of their story. That message of fear not always comes at the beginning. If this is true for all of them, can we believe it's true for us as well? Yeah.